God in me. Worship the God in evermore me. The world's a losing door, and it's hard as the rain can see. My God, hold me to me. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy.
Every word. Thank you so much for joining us at Chester First Baptist Church this weekend. It is so nice to be back in person with all of y'all. In a few short weeks, Mr. Chris Mathis will be leading the Jeremiah Johnson Connect Group called The Dark Side. That'll be on Wednesday nights at 6 p.m. and that will start on July 13th. Brother Lynn Turner will be making his round again back here for his last time once again. We don't know the exact date yet of when Brother Lynn Turner will be back, but it will be in August or either September. Miss Schaefer's Children's Church will be coming to Sunday mornings in September, and I hope you'll be praying for the launch date on that. We also have Youth Tonight at 6 p.m. right across the street from the church. Thank you so much for joining us. Would you please bow with me in opening prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful day that you've given us. God, open our hearts to hear your word and to, to see you, Lord God, for who you really are. God, uh, stir us up to enter into a time of worship to say that you are worthy and to lift your name on high, to forget about what's going on in our own lives and our own minds, and God, just focus our attention onto you. God, be glorified, be lifted up in this house this morning, Lord God, because it is truly dedicated to you. Lord, we humbly ask all this in the everlasting name of Jesus. Amen. You're another new
Some things have to be removed. When a pot's lip becomes uneven, the potter will reach for a tool that looks like a thick needle and gently place the point near the spinning clay, just below the flaw. With his right hand on the outside and his left hand carefully supporting the inside of the lip, the needle-like instrument is slowly pushed through the clay. The moment the potter feels the tip on his inside hand, he quickly lifts the clay. The flaw is gone. The clay pot continues to spin. Often the potter will reach for a tool that is a long narrow stick with a leather cloth or sponge attached to it. The purpose of this tool is to remove the excess water or clay sludge that has drained the base of the inside of the vessel as it is formed. By removing this material, the potter keeps the pot from being weakened by the extra water. As you are being changed into the image of God, there are times when God must remove things from your life in order to protect the finished image and to enhance His image in your life. Remember, God works on the inside first. There are things deep within you God must deal with in order for true life to come forward. When He acts, there is loss. Loss is not easy, but you want these things removed from you. Left alone without God's hand to remove them, you will be uneven, heavy with things you don't need, or on the verge of collapse. Paul understood how God removes things within your life. He said in Philippians 3, 7 and 8, At one time all these things were important to me, but because of Christ, I decided that they are worth nothing. I think that all things are worth nothing compared with the greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. Because of Christ, I lost all these things, and now I know that they are all worthless trash. All I want is Christ. Ask the Lord to cut away all things within you that might hinder your being the vessel of honor He desires. I chose that particular video because, you know, God saves us not to keep us the same as we were, but he, he saves us and changes us. He sanctifies us, so we look more like him. Last, uh, last, sun, last, oh, last Saturday night, I preached out in the uh, parking lot, talked about how Paul was telling a group of people at a church at Galatia that the gospel is Jesus only. It's not Jesus in church or Jesus in baptism or Jesus in being a good person or Jesus in Moses or Jesus in the law. It's Jesus. 
And what we see Paul doing, I'm going to kind of continue that thought with Genesis 1. So if you have your Bible, you can open up or turn on your Bible or the words will be up on the screen. In Paul's life, I see three different snapshots, three different pictures in this Gen uh, Galatians 1, 13 through 24. He has a B.C. life. Church, say B.C. life. That B.C. life is his life before Christ. Uh, then he had to come to Jesus moment. He met the Lord, so he, he met Jesus, and we see that picture. And then we see his life after, after his decision, that A.D. life. B.C., of course, you've got to have A.D. After that decision to follow Christ, his life was different. He wasn't just saved to go to heaven. He was saved for a calling. He wasn't just saved to be saved, but he was saved to serve. Uh, I want to look at that first snapshot. Uh, that BC life. Uh, the Bible says in Galatians 1 13 through 14, for you've heard of my previous way of life. Anybody have, a, anybody have a previous way of life they're just not really proud of? Bad decisions, bad choices, bonehead moves. He says, man, you've heard about my previous life, my past in Judaism. How intensely I persecuted the church of God. Now, Paul is writing this after he's come to Christ, but he still knows that that church belongs to God. The church of God. And I tried to destroy it. And if Paul would have done his job, if he would have been successful, we wouldn't be sitting in a church today. If Paul would have been successful, he would have aborted the early church and there would be no church right now. I was advancing in Judaism, my religion, beyond many Jews of my own age. I was better than everybody else. And I was extremely zealous for the traditions of my fathers. He's saying, I, I observed all the traditions of how I grew up. Before Paul's conversion experienced, he believed that killing Christians and persecuting the church is something that God liked. He thought it was something that honored God because he saw the church as a direct threat to Judaism. He saw the church as a direct threat to God. He saw it as something that was no good, so he tried his best to strangle it. He tried his best to abort it. His B.C. life was built on tradition, the law. It was built on, 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 uh, it was built on ritual. And despite the fact that when you read the Old Testament, you can see the threat of God's grace through everything, all leading up to the, the new covenant in Christ. But yet he didn't see that. What he saw was what I can accomplish on my own, what I can do in my own power, what I can do in my own strength, what I can do by being a good person, what I can do by being better than everybody else. And, and he was hoping that those things would make him be loved by God. He was hoping that those things, things he could do in his own power, would draw him closer to God. And um, as, as Paul was this, this Pharisee, this Hebrew of Hebrews, if you will, um, he, he saw the church as a violation and a threat to God. I want you to look at Philippians 3, 4 through 6. If anyone else thinks he has reason to put confidence in the flesh, and again, he's bragging. He said, man, if anybody can go to heaven by being a good person, it's me. I have more. I was circumcised on the eighth day from the people of Israel. I'm from the tribe of Benjamin. I'm a Hebrew of the Hebrews. In regard to the law, I was a Pharisee. As for zeal, I was persecuting the church. As for legalistic righteousness, he's saying I was faultless. I mean, oh, Paul was bragging on all these things that he did. He was a rising star in Judaism. I mean, he would have been the next Billy Graham, if you will, or the next D.L. Moody in Judaism. I mean, he was a, he was a hot shot. He had studied under the best rabbis. He had personal piety that was above reproach and 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 maybe he comes from a long line of great pharisees maybe he comes from a great line of of jewish leaders maybe his his papa or his daddy came from that and while he was persecuting the church he was profiting from his faith he was progressing in his faith paul's bc life had him consenting to the murder of stephen the first christian martyr had him burning churches, persecuting churches. And here's the thing, man, if you're a dad in the house, you could have went to Jewish jail. And we went to Israel before, and we've seen that pit that they put Jesus in. The Jews had their own jails. So if you follow Jesus and you refuse to stop following, you can be put in jail. If dad goes to jail, what does mom do with the seven kids? Man, it was a freak show. I mean, it was, it was a show that was going on. And these people's lives were being torn apart. At the center of it was Paul. And he was doing it all thinking, I'm religious, God is glorified by this, God's getting more in love with me. John R.W. Stout said this about Paul. If Paul was as Jewish as a Jewish guy could get. And what, what Stout basically says is that there's no way that dude would have changed his mind on his own. There's no way that a philosopher or an educator, there's no way this guy would have changed his mind. This is what Stout 
says, and I'll, I'll quote him. He says, not, uh, now a man in that mental and emotional state, as Paul, is in no mood to change his mind or even to have it changed for him by men. Only God could reach him, and he did. So that first picture we have of Paul is his B.C. life, persecuting the churches. Man, but then there was that second snapshot that Paul shows us when he met Jesus, when he came to him. And by the way, church, if you're a born-again Christian, your testimony reflects Paul's because we've all have a, we all have a B.C. life. We all have a life before we came to Christ. And then we have that story of coming to Jesus. And let's look at Paul's. But when God, this is in Galatians 1.15, but when God, and he's saying it was God who did this. It wasn't Judaism. It wasn't the law. It wasn't ritual. It wasn't me being a good person. It wasn't me being righteous. It wasn't me obeying everything. But God, who set me apart from birth, church say birth. God had a plan for Paul even before he was ever born. And he called me by his, not the law, not by ritual, not by being a good Jew, but he called me by grace. The same way he called you and me. He was pleased to reveal his son to me. Y'all, the son's name is Jesus. Paul grew up in Judaism. He understood that God spoke to Moses. He didn't know if God spoke through Jesus. And he didn't, he for sure didn't believe in the resurrected Jesus, but something happened. But God revealed the gospel to me through his son Jesus that pleased to reveal his son to me so that I might preach him among the Gentiles. And I didn't consult any man. What Paul is saying is what I got when I met Jesus didn't come from Gamil. It didn't come from any of my teachers. It didn't come from any other Pharisee. It didn't come from any other scribe. What was revealed to me was by God. Church today, if you know that Jesus is the Lord of the universe, if you know that Jesus died on a cross for your sin, you've got, I I need to let you know something. It wasn't us that told you that. It was Him who told you that. The gospel message you received was from Him. When Paul described his past life, it was about what he had done personally and how he had changed the focus of his life and was trying to make God love him by being good. He tells his audience that the only way he can explain the change in his attitude, the only way he can, ex- he can explain the change in his heart is God. There was no other person, no other reason, no other excuse, but God changed me. God did all the work. God saved him by grace. And church, God still saves by grace. It's not by your works or my works. It's not by anything we can do. It's not by our efforts. We are saved by the grace of God. It wasn't the law that saved him. It wasn't his Jewish ancestry that saved him. It wasn't tradition that saved him. Church, What saved him was the grace of God through Jesus Christ. And if you're saved today, understand you're saved the exact same way. No other way but by the grace of God. God saved him by grace through Christ. And when Paul was lost, he had religion, but he didn't have Jesus. When Paul was lost, he had self-righteousness, but he didn't have Jesus. When Paul was lost, he had a reputation, but he didn't have Jesus. When Paul was going through the motions of Judaism, he was religious, but he didn't have Jesus. Jesus, church, God revealed Himself to Paul in a powerful way that changed not only his mind, but it changed his heart as well. Paul's conversion, when you look at his life, it wasn't gradual. He didn't say a salvation prayer and then six months and eight months later, then he got involved in church. And another six and eight months later, then he'd get, maybe he'd get involved in a prayer ministry. Maybe when, when Paul got saved, he got radically saved. He was radically saved in a moment. Now, church, when you get saved, you're not gradually saved. You're saved in an instant. Your salvation comes instantaneously. Now, the sanctifying part of your life, God making you look more like Jesus, that is the gradual part of your salvation. But your salvation is one and done. I've prayed with people before as they're on their way out of this mortal coil. And they'll pray in church. I, I, I tell you right now, they give their life to Jesus on their deathbed. They are just as saved as anybody who's walked with the Lord for 60, 70, 80, 90 years. They're saved in an instant. His call to salvation was accompanied. It was accompanied with a call. Let's, let's look at that. Paul's A.D. life. He got saved, but he got saved to serve. Galatians 1, 17 through 24. I didn't get this message. I didn't go up to Jerusalem to see who the apostles were before I was, but, but I went immediately to Arabia and later returned to Damascus. Then after three years, I had a professor in seminary who said that for three years when he was in Arabia, he took seminary classes taught by Jesus. I don't know about that, but it was interesting. 
Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem and got acquainted with Peter and stayed with him 15 days. I saw none of the other apostles, only James and the Lord's brother. He was referring to the 11 disciples minus Judas plus, uh, plus Mattathias. I assure you before God that I am writing you what I'm writing you. It ain't no lie. What I'm telling you is the truth. What I'm telling you is the straight dope. What I'm telling you, I believe with every being in my being, with every fiber in my being. That's what Paul is saying. He says, is, it is no lie. Later, I went to Syria and Cilicia. I was personally unknown to the churches in Judea that were in Christ. They only heard of the report. This man used to have another life. This man used to persecute the church. My brother-in-law's in Jewish jail because he went over there and persecuted that church. He said, that's all they've heard. That's all they know about me. That all they know is about me breathing threats against the church and telling people how crazy Jesus is. That's all they knew about me when I got there. He goes on to say, the man who formerly persecuted us is now preaching to us. Well, who but God can do that? The one who was burning down our buildings is now burning with revival through this room. Church, Paul says, later I went to Syria in Christ. The uh, they only heard the report, the man who formerly persecuted us is now preaching the gospel. He once tried to destroy it. And they praised what? Because of me. They've seen the change. They've seen the transformation. They've seen the conversion. After Paul's conversion, he was a different person with a different perspective and a different passion. The early church's fire-breathing dragon was turned into her most powerful voice to the nations. The people whom he had detested, the Gentiles, the pagans, they were now his key demographic. That's who God had sent him to bring the gospel to. People he didn't used to like. People he didn't used to care for. People he didn't used to respect. Church, you want the answer to racism? His name is Jesus. Because there's no male or female, there's no Jew or Gentile, there's no slave or master, there's just sinners who need a Savior. And Paul got it. Paul understood it and his life showed it. The people whom he had detested, he was now given charge to preach the gospel. And his call to salvation was accompanied with a call to serve. Church, listen to that again. His call to salvation was accompanied with a call to serve. If you are saved, you need to understand something. Your call to salvation also come, came with a call to serve attached to it. You were called to go into a service, into a ministry. Ephesians 2.10 says, For hey, y'all, we are all God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do what? Man, we're called to do good work for the kingdom of God, which God prepared in advance for us to do. He saved us to do them. St. Peter says in 1 Peter 2, 9, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of Him who called you out of darkness and into His wonderful light. Peter is saying God has called you out of the kingdom of darkness and put you into a kingdom of light, so shine. Church, we've been called just like Paul. We've been called not just to be saved, but called to serve. And, and Paul was called to be a witness for Jesus. He was called to be a servant to the Lord Jesus. It wasn't just salvation he gained. It was a different life that he gained. It was a different trajectory that he gained. His life passion was now to see people saved by the same gospel that had saved him. Not the gospel plus Moses or not the gospel plus anything, just the gospel of Jesus. Church, Paul's story is your story too. Believe it or not, his story is your story because we all have a past. Man, we all have, mis we all have bad decisions in our, in our life that we're not proud of or we have all have uh, instances or occurrences that we look back on and we're shameful or we're regretful. Man, we all have those in our life and Paul is no exception. You are no exception. I am no exception. We all have those moments in our life and we, we're not too proud of them. Because they, they are broken promises. They're, they're broken reputations. They are broken relationships. And that's the key about, that's the key of this whole thing. When we are before Christ, our life is broken. We don't have peace. It's broken. We don't have hope. It's broken. We don't have contentment. It's broken because we don't have Jesus. Man, but praise God. He came to us and He revealed Himself to us. And He changed us. We heard about God's grace demonstrated through the cross of Jesus. We understand that Jesus went to the cross voluntarily. He went there on His own volition. Nobody took His life. Nobody killed Him. Nobody murdered Him. He went to the cross voluntarily for you and me. We know that He also went to the cross for a vicarious element. It means that He took your cross, Maria. He took your cross, Tim. He took Mike's cross. It means that He went in our place, stood in our place, took our punishment of what death and sin bring. So He... 
volunteered to do that. He vicariously took our cross. And the third thing is, praise God, when Jesus was on the cross, He was not, he was not just there voluntarily and vicariously. He was there victoriously. He showed us that there is, there is power over the grave, power over sin, power over the guilt and condemnation of iniquity. And that's what Jesus showed us. And we, when we heard that marriage, when we heard that message, it changed us. It just made sense to us. Church, when we meet Jesus, we change. When we meet Jesus, we are not who we were. And I want to give you an interesting thought. If you are who you were before you met Jesus, are you sure you met Jesus? Are you sure? Are you sure you met Him? Because if you met Him, I'm not saying we're perfect because we're not. But what I'm saying is if we're in a relationship with Jesus, it affects our attitude, our actions, the way we behave, the way we post, the way we interact with people. It literally changes everything about us. It's Jesus that makes us love our enemies. Trust me, it ain't anything inside of us. It's Jesus that makes us pray for those who persecute us because you and I both know we don't want to pray for them suckers. It's the Jesus inside of us that makes us turn the other cheek. It's the Jesus inside of us that allows us to love people who disagree with us. It's the Jesus inside of us that allows us to walk hand in hand with somebody without necessarily seeing eye to eye. Deep down in your heart, you know what I'm saying is true. Deep down in your heart, the devil is telling you, oh, that's just a bunch of crazy stuff. That ain't real. Church, understand something. That's the father of all lies trying to disrupt and trip you up. The Bible, which I believe with all of my heart, said that God has saved me to serve in His kingdom. I want you to look at how old Paul Walking away from that B.C. life, I, I want to look a little bit more about how he came to Jesus. Acts 26, verse 13. I was on the road. I saw a light from heaven. Man, it was brighter than the sun. It was blazing around me and all of my companions, my homies. We fell to the ground. Now, I want you to understand something. Everybody fell to the ground, but nobody else saw what Paul did. Nobody else got the voice from the Lord the way Paul did. I pray that when God speaks, I'm there and I hear Him and I see Him. I want to make sure that I get a message like this. We all fell to the ground and I heard a voice saying to me in Aramaic, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? It's hard for you to kick against the goads. King Jimmy says it's hard for you to kick against the pricks. Now what that is is... Uh, that is number one. It's an old saying. 2,000 years ago, um, it was a saying that would have been similar to this. You can't fight City Hall. Y'all ever heard of that? Okay, you don't even need a context on that. You know what that means. It means government's going to do what government's going to do. You can't help it. You can't stop it. It is what it is. When Paul said, it's hard for thee to kick against the goads, it was a, it was a saying that would have been known 2,000 years ago. What, it was, what that would have meant 2,000 years ago is... You can't fight God because He wins every time. And what Jesus is telling Paul, and I got a feeling that Jesus had been talking to Paul for a long time and he wasn't listening. He had to know the gospel. He had heard the Christians. He had to know what the church was. He had been persecuting them. He had heard the gospel but hadn't embraced it. He had heard that Jesus was resurrected but didn't believe it. And all this time, I believe that God is reaching out to him, but he's kicking against that prick, you see, a farmer would, would have an animal, an oxen, and he would steer it in the right direction, and he would have a, a little, it would be a wooden dowel with some type of a metal or iron uh, prick at the end of it, like a, like a, let's say a big old railroad spike. And when the farmer wanted the, the ox to go that way, he'd apply pressure in one direction. If he wanted it to go that way, he'd apply pressure in another direction. And if that stubborn ox would, would say, well, I'm not going to listen to you, the more that ox tried to fight, the more damage and more suffering it had. Church, if that doesn't describe my relationship with God, I don't know what does. Because I, I will fight Him every step of the way. And He's saying, dude, if you'll just stop, I'll point you in the right direction. If you just stop, we'll get this field done. If you just stop fighting me. That's my story. I told you, man, Paul's story is your story too. 
And I know this. It sure is hard to live with that goad on your neck. It's hard to live out of the will of God. It's hard to, to, to live out of the will of God in our modern society. I believe this with all my heart. People are searching for meaning. They're looking for, for meaning in a bottle or a bed or in an identity. Or they're looking for meaning in money or morality or religion. People are all over looking for, for something to hold on to. They're looking all over for something to embrace. But yet they resist God all the time knowing deep down in their heart they need to repent and believe. Church today, maybe deep down in your heart you want to be saved. What's holding you back? Baggage? Let me, let me tell you something. Ain't one of us up in this room or online ain't got baggage. There's not one of us here. And you might be thinking, well, well I've messed up so bad, God, God, there's no way God can love me. Yeah, He does. In fact, maybe the reason why you're here today is because you need to understand something. God knows all your mistakes and all your sin. He wants me to tell you today that He loves you. He loves you. He's not angry at you. He's not ticked off at you. He's not waiting for you to mess up again so we can pop you in the back of the head. And he loves you. In Illinois, any good farmer knows that if you want to keep your horses or your cattle in a certain area, you build a fence. Keep them all locked in. They try to get up to the fence, they'll either give them a shot of electricity or maybe there's some barbed wire on there. They're going to stay inside the fence. They can wander all over, but you've got to stay inside the fence. What do you do if you owned a ranch? They're called stations in Australia. What would happen if, let's say you own four or 5,000 daggum acres of land and it's just nothing but desert out there. It's just, it's the outback. What do you do? You can't put up a fence that big. That's superfluous. It ain't going to do no good. So this is what they do. The farmer will dig a well, and at the bottom of that well is clean water, cold water, and those, those, those cattle need that. They need that water. And what the farmers over in Australia found is that it doesn't take 4,000 acres of, of fence to keep these, these cattle or, uh, uh, on my property. All it takes is me to provide a well of clean, cold water for these cattle. Now, they might wander off a little bit, but they're going to come back to that well because they need the water. Church, Jesus isn't keeping you and I uh, in the kingdom of God with the fence. He's not using the law to keep us blocked in. He's using a well of love to keep us around. He's not using negative reinforcement. He's saying, if you stay with me, there's a well of living water that if you drink of, you'll never thirst again. That's what Jesus is holding us around with. Don't think that God's going to get you in a headlock. I'm not saying He can. He's God. He can do whatever He wants. But this is what I know. When I get too far away from the well, I can't wait to get back to it. The longer I'm away from the well, the drier I get. You see, the good shepherd doesn't build a fence around us to keep us from leaving. Instead, he provides a positive reason for us to stay him, stay with him. He uses, the love, he uses love, not the law, to draw us to himself. In fact, Jesus said this. He said, my sheep listen to me. They hear my voice. They know me, and, I, and they follow me. The Bible says this. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them, and they follow me. Church, God knows your past. He knows your mistakes. And he still went to the cross for you. You know what? He knew you were going to get a divorce before you got a divorce. He knew that you were going to uh, sin sexually before you ever sinned sexually. He knew that you were going to have an anger issue before you were ever born. He knew that you were going to do, do he, he knew that we were going to do dumb things that, that didn't bring glory to him or the kingdom of God. You ready for the good news? He loves us anyway. And here's the amazing thing. I don't know all about you, but I've never burned down a church in jail for their faith I've never hunted down Christians I've never given a thumbs up and said okay yeah let's kill that old boy like uh, Paul did with Stephen you know what God used Paul in an incredible way and his past is worse than anybody in this room I got good news for us guys he can use every single one of us if he can use a murderer and a church persecutor he can use damaged funky people like you and me Man, you've been saved, and that's great. What have you been saved to do? Pam, if you'd come up, honey, and start playing. 
You've been saved, and that's great, but you were saved for more than just dying and going to heaven. You were saved for working and serving the kingdom of God right here on earth. And you're saying, Brother Mike, you said I'm saved. No strings attached. Okay. But you need to understand something. If you're doing the same bull that you were doing before you met Jesus, chances are you've not met him. And I'm going to say that this isn't, this isn't popular. Christians go to church. Christians are involved in a local body. And you're here today. I don't know if everybody in this room is, is a Christian, but can I tell you what? You coming here says something. It says something about who you are. It talks about how you're going to spend your Sunday morning honoring the Sabbath day and keeping it holy. Why? Because he is. But maybe God has something more involved than just coming to church. Maybe it's involved in, a, in an act of ministry. Maybe you need to be growing in your faith with Connect group or, or pray and go. Because you're not who you were. For some of us, we've been saved, but man, just barely. We're going to make it to heaven, but it's going to smell like we just got out of a burning house just in the nick of time. You know what, guys? When we go to heaven and we, we meet the Lord and we stand before Him, I want to hear those beautiful words. Well done, my good and faithful servant. And if that's the case, then that means we have to serve. If I could have every head bowed and every eye closed today, if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, the way Paul did in his B.C. days, to a cross to die in your place and in my place. He was crucified, dead, and on the third day, He rose again. I believe that more than anything. And Paul came to believe it. And it changed his life. In fact, it changed the world. Today, if you've not received Jesus as your Savior, today's the day you meet Him. I invite you to pray with me. Dear Jesus, I am a sinner. And I am broken. And I've wandered away from You. But today I've heard the good news. How You died on the cross. And You were buried. And You rose again. So I could live. So my sins could be forgiven. So I could be restored into fellowship with the Father so I could live in His presence. Jesus, forgive me of my sin. I profess You as my Lord. Thank You, Jesus. As every head is bowed and every eye continues to be closed, You're saved. Great. Now what? With Your gift of salvation comes the gift of a calling to serve. With every head bowed and every eye closed, would you pray with me just real quick? Just praying about service to God. Dear God, it's me. What would you have me do? How would you have me serve? I'm not going to put you on the spot. But I would like to give you an opportunity just to confirm that God has spoken to you and you've heard Him and you've received that word. If God has told you what, if God has told you that you need to go about serving, that you need to be aware that you've been saved to serve. Maybe today you know that you need to pick, you need to pick up the slack there. You need to, you need to, uh, Get a little bit more serious about that end of it. That third picture. You can just lift your hand and put it right back down. And say, yep, preacher, that's me. I know I need to step up my game. Okay? Any more? Thank you, brother in the back. Anyone else? Thank you, sweetie. Anyone else? Thank you, huh? Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Almighty God, today, I want to thank you for you speaking to us. I want to thank you, Father, for you speaking to the hearts of your people, for the decisions that were made, for the peace that's been given, for the hope that's been received. Thank you, Father, for the beautiful message of your grace through your Son, Jesus. And we give you praise and glory in the name of our Savior. 
and amen. Y'all, I'm going to ask you to stand, and we're going to sing one more song, and we're going to, we're going to cut you loose. Told you we'd be new build the boats that second time. I've been wandering through the desert. today miss lacy yeah right on honey and uh she's a she's a big face here uh, she's gonna get baptized here next sunday and we're just so glad that you're here honey we're so glad that you're here and uh she's doing a good job and you know you know how you know what she did to sing up here she came and she asked church that's the thing about the church if you want to serve Ask. We will put you to work, all right? And uh, so that kind of feeds into where we were today. Let's go to him in a word of prayer. Lord, we love you above all things. And Lord, at least speaking for myself, I, I don't know why you do, but I sure am glad that it's true. Father, thank you for loving me when I'm unlovable. Thank you for keeping me when I doubt. Thank you for staying, Lord God, when I feel like running. Thank you for being steadfast when, when I give in. Thank you for loving me enough to say no. Thank you for the cross. Lord God, there's so much going on in our world today that I don't understand. But God, I get you. You're the constant. 
You're the unchangeable, unmovable constant. Lord, in a million years, you'll still be God. In a trillion years, you'll still be God. And I'll still love you. Lord God, thank you for the promise and the hope of heaven. And thank you for the peace that you give us until we get home. And Father God, I pray for that peace over this congregation. Would you bless them and keep them? Let your face shine upon them and be gracious to them. And lift your countenance upon them and give them your peace. And it's in Christ's name I pray. And amen.